Welcome to In The Know With Neo, and thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Joshua Moore, and for those who aren't aware, Neo is a student-led social justice initiative that amplifies the voices of underrepresented small business owners within the Cincinnati community, and we're excited to share this week's episode with you. Greetings to those tuning into In The Know With Neo. I'm your host, Joshua Moore, and this week we have an exciting and Bearcat special as we're speaking with Dean Marianne Lewis. If you're a Linder College of Business student, I'm sure you're familiar with our guest today. But for those who aren't aware, Dean Lewis is, of course, the current dean at the University of Cincinnati's Linder College of Business, while also holding the titles of director of the, is it a, I always get this word wrong, is it Kodiak's Business Scholars? Oh, oh I'm not the director anymore. Not anymore? uh uh-uh. Scratch that. That is not <laughs> correct. The, my, I was. I was the founding director okay. of the College of Business Scholars. The founding director. Yes. That, sound, that sounds better you to like me. You like that? Okay. Um, still professor of management. I am. Still teaching management at the Linder College of Business. And before her time at the University of Cincinnati, Dean Lewis served as the dean of K- CAS Business mm-hmm. School at the C- City University London and a UK Fulbright Scholar at Cardiff University. Dean Lewis, I'm so excited to begin this conversation But first, the simple question of how are you as we're concluding the ninth week of classes um, and we're nearing spring break? Oh, Josh, thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you. And it's spring. What's not to love? Spring break is is next week. We're just going to have lots of fun. I love the sun is out and I'm looking out into Lindner Hall and it's just buzzing, which is great. Couldn't ask for any more. Couldn't. Couldn't ask for any more. So to give a brief background of how this all came about, and how we're using the newly um, founded Linder Podcast Studio, which is an amazing honor. Um, I guess we're the first people in there, so mm-hmm. it feels a little special. Um, but we started In the Know with Neo just as an idea last semester with the overarching goal of curating Neo as a familiar face within the community. Um, and none of the work we would, do, the none of the work we do, uh, would be would be possible without the foundational support and backing from such an amazing place, such as the University of Cincinnati and specifically the Linder College of Business. So shall we get into the first question? Oh, let's do. Let's do it. Let's do it. So for those who aren't aware, who is Dean Marianne Lewis to you? An elevator pitch, if you Mm -hmm. will. Um, And after that, can you brief us shortly of how you landed as the dean Mm -hmm. um, at the Linder College of Business? Um, So, I mean, I'll give you my my brief history uh, is one of, I don't know, rebellion and change in some ways. So... uh, I grew up in academia. My dad uh, was a pretty well-known uh, academic, and so I moved between Harvard, Stanford, and INSEAD's oh, wow. business schools all through growing up. And I think there were two things that come out of that. One is my rebellion was I came to the Midwest. You know, after growing up on the coast, I really mm-hmm. did want to find my own space. Okay. And truly, when I got to the Midwest, I, was, I felt like I found my people. I just loved, I loved the the kind of calmer culture. Mm-hmm. I love the community feel that you don't really get yeah. at cities like San Francisco and mm-hmm. I- the Bay Area and Boston. I mean, I love those cities, but I felt really at home Something here. Different. The other thing that I, I think was a big aha for me when I was growing up like that, I mean, I, I knew those campuses well. I spent, I did all of my like childhood high school work and stuff, yeah. serving donuts to executive MBAs at Stanford that and other places. Experience. It was and as much as I love those schools, I really kind of realized that I wanted to be at a public university. Mm. I, I just love the mission of being much more access oriented than elite. Okay. I just think there's something so about cool. the grittiness yeah. of our students. I, I, truly, I do. I love it. And I think then the final piece to that is I was determined not to be an academic. That was going to be my <laughs> final rebellion. You can see where that got me. But I think that was that was great for me because I realized even in my MBA, which I, I did at Indiana, at Kelly, um, I was paying as much attention to how people taught as what they were teaching. Mm-hmm. And I, I love students. I always have. I just think learning is the most powerful tool we have. And it didn't take long to realize I wasn't heading to Wall Street. Wow. I really needed to That's be a very, academia. very unique story. That's one thing I always point out during these conversations. You get to hear the back end of how like the present day got to come about just having that experience of being at like very prestigious universities Mm -hmm. and how you had the realizations that you wanted to be at a public university. It's super cool. And it shows us how 
we all got to the point we're at today. So, and it's never what you think. I mean, yeah, we all take yeah. windy roads, but yeah. Cool, cool. So the first thing I wanted to start off with is kind of on a selfish note. So I've been fascinated by the idea of and rather mm -hmm. than or. And since I first ran into the concept a few years ago, I believe it was from Gary Vaynerchuk, um, just like a, a lot of the content he was putting out. So when I saw the foundation of your book was both was on both and and, I was immediately fascinated. So the first question I have for you is like, what was when and what was that aha moment when you decided that you wanted to write this book on mm -hmm. this specific topic? So really early in my career when I was doing research and I loved manufacturing, so I was actually studying manufacturing, I realized all I saw was tensions. So I saw tensions. This is, this is early when automation was taking off and people were debating, is automation about control or flexibility? Is it about de-skilling or upskilling? And I could kind of keep going on. And I thought, there's something else here. There's something else here about these tensions. So I really kind of went down a crazy rabbit hole and I started studying tensions. I started to, this tug of war that we feel in so many parts of our yeah, lives. In all areas. All areas. So I really was studying them at high level leadership management areas. But I think the more I, I dug into it, the more I realized we live in tensions, yeah. work and life That's and remote and in person and right, you name it. Um, and so that was the aha. Mm. And so the focus became not manufacturing or innovation. And I've studied lots of and governance. I've studied lots of topics. But the theme is tensions because we swim in them. And I have come to find that some people navigate them very differently yeah. and to really great positive benefits. That's a really great point in how you've labeled it. Because as you said, people are going through that constant tension of like this or that, but they might not realize it. And I'm labeling it as just the simplistic term of tension gives it like a easier way of understanding what you're going through, yeah. even though you don't really realize that's what you're going through. So I love that. And then the next question I have to follow up on that is with the with that being the foundation of the book, how have you like breathe this idea throughout your professional and personal journey? Well, I I hope and try to, to live it daily because one of the kind of big learnings I've had is that when you're faced in this tension and you feel that tug of war, there are really, there are two approaches. There's kind of a typical default is to either or. You know, you mm -hmm. weigh the pros and cons and you make a trade-off. But that is an incredibly limiting approach. Yeah. And worse, I've seen it lead to a host of vicious cycles that we could talk about. But on the positive side, that those tensions pr create a creative friction that opens up possibilities mm. to change and innovate yeah. and learn. Um, and I mean, in my own leadership experience, and it's been interesting since the books come out, I, I talk about this increasingly with fellow deans, with the provost, with others. You know, you think about kind of the world I live in. Um, on the one hand, you could say, you know, attention is between students, the thought leadership, the faculty side, and our partners. But the way I think about it even more is I see tensions within each of those. So mm. when we're talking mm. about students and student success, I have heard interesting debates about, is it about excellence or inclusion? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Both. It's about both. Yeah. Right? And so how do we get... So so one of the interesting d discussions I've ended up having with my boards is our approach is excellence through inclusion. Mm. Right? That's a, you mm -hmm. change that question and you change the whole dialogue yeah. about it. I'm not going to debate with you which one it is because that's the wrong question. Yeah. How do we build excellence through inclusion, through really making sure our access mission is bringing the best of everyone together and learning together in a really powerful way? Mm -hmm. I do the same thing, you know, when I think about thought leadership and our faculty, we can get into these debates between. We call it the three-legged stool of academia. <laughs> is it about research, teaching, or service? Yes, right? Oh, yes. And so impact, and really Next Lives Here is a great framework for it, is impact is the connector. Mm -hmm. The point is, how I do you do. find synergies between those, mm -hmm. right, that make a powerful, positive difference? So I try to work through it, but it, it, I'm not saying tensions are easy, because mm -hmm. they're not. And I've worked with remarkable, remarkable leaders globally who are very good at navigating tensions. And they will all say, as much as they are always a challenge, the difference between an either or thinker and a both and thinker is that you treat them as opportunities, mm -hmm. right? You think there is something in that tension mm -hmm. that holds new potential. And that excites me. 
And so I think I live that. And oftentimes, you, you've heard, you may have heard this in research, we tend to research who we are and what we think. Mm -hmm. So even that rebellion of, you know, Comes back little to kid, yeah. Marianne Lewis, it, it's still there because mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love the point that you, the call that you made that the tension brings about different opportunities mm -hmm. to look into different channels. And I think that's been evident throughout even my four years here at Cincinnati and different changes that have been made in different colleges on campus. Um, and just the way that the way they go about serving the students, the faculty and the staff. And you beat me to my next question. So I guess I don't even have to ask that one, but that was going to hit it. on the different initiatives that Linder focuses on, yeah. which is the student focused, thought leader driven and partner forward initiatives. Um, so it was, that was just really great to hear. I, every time I sit in these seats and get to talk to the guests that we speak across, I'm just like blown away myself. I'm like trying to take in all the knowledge while still trying to remain like in the <laughs> moderator conversation. Um, but so but you know, I'll add one for... to that, Josh. I mean, one of the things that drew me back to Cincinnati from London, and there were a lot of things, if I'm honest, <laughs> that drew me back. Um, but one of them is that I absolutely love the co-op model. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that one it drives me back every time is that you can have real debates and questions about you know, is it about the classroom or the experience, yeah. right? Where's the learning happening? And it's not just that it's both, is that it's that they feed each other, right? The, the better we do in a classroom, the more prepared you are out in the real world. And then after you've had, whether it's a co-op or a study abroad or a, a project that you've been working on in Neo, right? Mm -hmm. Then you come back into the classroom, you have so much more to offer. 100%. And so you, they call it absorbative capacity. I'm gonna give you a little term. But basically it's it's how do you start to build, you know, the brain matter to be more accessible to the insights mm -hmm. that are coming in. And I think that's a really powerful combination of the experience and the classroom. Yeah, I've definitely noticed that too as well, just going through different interviews and. Yeah seeing which points in your past experiences you hit on. And it's like, I've gone through interviews recently um, at Google for, and then Haley's gonna be at Google as well. And I know Nora's gonna be there um, as well. Yeah. But I hit on I hit on experiences from Nia when I was a project lead. I hit on experiences from my internships and co-ops um, from the past summers. And I just hit on my classroom experiences and like all the value that that provides. So it definitely just does open the doors. It's not one door, it's multiple mm -hmm. doors. You can go on each, which like signifies that and or either. The next question moving on, it's a bit into relation uh, to that, but you made a major milestone uh, when you became the Dean of the Linder College of Business as you were the first woman to lead the Linder College of Business, which is an amazing, amazing feat in itself. Um, so just a very simple question, how did that feel accomplishing that? Because even well, when you're walking up the yeah. stairs, there's the pictures of the deans, and I notice it every time I walk up. Do, do you? I do. You know, it was funny. When they were putting up the, the, the pictures in the new building, they asked me if we could go ahead and do my portrait. And the reason I say that is because the original tradition was to do it when you left. Hmm. And I said, well, shouldn't we stick with the tradition? And then they showed me what it was going to look like, and I said, oh, got it. I think you're the one yeah, with, we, we with better red two on. So yeah. it's like... <laughs> That wasn't purposeful, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of it standing It looks good. Out. Well, you know, I, I would say to that, Josh, um, obviously it, it, it does feel good. And I, I am proud to, to serve, and I hope I'm, I'll be glad when we have, we aren't saying first mm -hmm. in front of a whole lot of things, yes, right? Yes. But um, it actually goes back a step earlier because uh, when I came back from my Fulbright from London in 2014, I, start, I had a couple of dean opportunities that had developed through that. And one of them was in London. And I was really debating on whether to take it because mm -hmm. I'll just be honest, it sounded really hard, right? Okay. Completely new role, new institution, new culture. It was scary. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my co-author, in fact, the co-author for this book sent me an article that said out of the top 100 business schools in the world and Cass is in the top 40, yeah. uh, only eight are led by women. She mm -hmm. said, you must go to London. Yeah. And I said, I know. I know. It's your calling. And and I, I'm so grateful I did. Yeah. Because I truly, I think then coming back just felt that much better because I had already climbed a very steep learning curve. And a, an epiphany when I was in London was, you know, if you're going to work this hard, you better do it at a place you love. Mm. Yeah, and I it think... Makes it way better. Yeah, that's, that's something I've realized throughout my four years is if you genuinely are involved in putting all of your effort into something it just makes the difficulty so much easier so much better which is exactly. which is an interesting thing mm -hmm. to say um 
But the next question I do have moving, I had a point where I wanted to hit on, but it'll come back to me. Um, but with many corporations, universities, and communities placing enhanced focus um, within recent years on diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiatives, especially here at UC, as the fall 2022 class was both the largest and the most diverse first year class in the Linder College of Business history. A lot of history is being made uh, within the past couple recently. So what do you see as the progress made here at the university mm -hmm. within that space within the last few years and maybe some strides in the future that are sought to be made mm -hmm. or just overarching or specific? You know, one of the things that that was kind of an aha to me when I when I came back from London, um, I, I had been the associate dean starting business fellows oh, wow. many years ago. Um, we love business fellows. I do too. We love business I, with, fellows. With all my heart. And when I got back, I realized as beautifully as the students and alumni and business fellows had done, it had basically all the work around DEI had stayed there. Mm -hmm. And that the real critical need was to make sure it pervaded everything we did. Mm -hmm. So I rebuilt my board. I elevated Nick Castro, who I think the world of, to an assistant dean. Yeah. I started working to make sure, how, how are we thinking from the faculty and staff to the boards, to who's coming in the classrooms to, right? I mean, this is, this is how you t make a, a great thing, because I truly mm -hmm. do believe in business fellows far better, because it, all of us get to learn more. Oh, yeah by learning from people with very different perspectives, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes back to the creative friction. This is what you want mm -hmm. your perfect world to look like because it will push us in so many different ways. You know, you, you stop taking things for granted, running with assumptions, stereotypes, whatever the case might be, because you know people. Mm -hmm. It has to be personal like that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I share that because I think we have, we have made valued progress and I'm proud of that and I think we have a lot of work to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and well, that's, that's just a, ongoing such a great thing to hear and yeah business fellows has been one of the most if not the most vital experiences I've had within my college experience most of my closest friends are in business fellows and being in a organization and culture where it's not only about community and involvement but also about like the potential that you can reach the students such as Haley, such as Norris, such as, there's just so many to Julian and Lance. Mm -hmm. Seeing those, it helps you realize your potential and the opportunity that's in front of you. And I definitely wouldn't be in the place where I'm at without business fellows. So thank you. Oh, thank you for that. that. And I just remembered the last, that that thought that left me. Um, but as I mentioned, we mm -hmm. had, um, oh, I didn't mention to you, but I couldn't go to the Cincinnati Business Achievement Awards because we had investor presentations from my entrepreneurship classes, but Candace from Lightship, mm -hmm. she was our investor there. And I just finished a podcast. She was the co um, or the past CEO of IBM. She was with, she was on Lex Friedman's podcast. Just spoke. She was the first uh, female oh. CEO for IBM, and Candace was the first, I believe, it was African American female to start a venture capital firm in Ohio. Um, so just like ring mm -hmm. and it's all just seeing patterns in that. It's super cool, but as you said, we're looking to get to that point where it's not the first. So I love it. I love it. So in close connection with the last question, and I know you mentioned it in one of your early answers, um, one of the mantras that's continually sung here at the University of Cincinnati is next lives here. Mm -hmm. um, it's even on one of the buildings that you can see from the highway, which is super, super cool, um, which sounds straightforward when you say it, uh, but I was just interested to hear your perspective mm -hmm. and opinion of what this means to you and specifically the Linder College of Business? You know, I think when I first got here, I was not quite sure what it meant, mm -hmm. but the more I'm living the mantra of next lives here, the more in my mind it means future looking, mm -hmm. right? Forward thinking, pushing the envelope, and doing that from the students and the programming work, from the research we're doing and the impact there to the way we're, part, we're working with partners, making all of those things with a better future in mind. Mm -hmm. And that means future for you, right? Great career, accelerated, moving in the, more importantly, where you want, mm -hmm. um, but also from the research that changes you know, people's the understandings world. of the world, right? Yeah. And business. And then with the partners, partners to me is where we apply it mm -hmm. and how we can all get better. I mean, 
I love that we're in the heart of Cincinnati. I think this is a fantastic city. I've had a couple of big of spring events, like we just had the Chamber event a couple of years ago, and we had both the so governors cute. of Ohio and Kentucky there talking about the new bridge. And you had this whole kind of, the whole night, it was just about a better future. Like, we are revving. We're revving at UC and Lindner mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. And those those virtuous cycles work because it's like a fuel to this pump and it just starts to move. And that's where, that's an exciting place to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. That's nice. Definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And it's, it's so evident just within my four years, it's gone by so quickly. Has it? So, so quickly. I, I wish I'd do another four, but <laughs> I <laughs> guess that's why I extended an for alum. another semester. Yeah. Um, but as I pre prepped for our conversation, um, and just doing, looking over your experiences in the past, um, I was blown away by your like decorated resume of awards, achievements and accolades. I have a lot written down, which I don't know if I'll get through you all of them. don't need to get through that. But uh, the 2022 Woman Who Mean Business winner, um, you've been recognized as, the, as one of the world's most cited researchers in your field, which is Web of Science. Paper of the Year Award in 2000, the Decade Award from the Academy of Management Review in 2021, and you've, your work has been um, displayed in journals such as the Harvard Business Review, the Academy of Management Journal, and the Journal of Operations Management, which is just amazing to say. It has to be a good feeling. Uh, but with this list, do you have like a most memorable achievement throughout the years or even just like a funny story to go along with the one? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a funny one. Uh, <laughs> You know, when I was first starting my research, I, I had a joke with my my little kids and my my husband at the time, and and I would say I'm I'm famous to five people, I'm famous to five people, and it would be my the reason I was I would say that is because I don't know who reads the academic yeah. journals, right? They're just academic journals, um, and so I, that would be it became this like long standing joke. But one of the really powerful experiences I had, I remember we were at a conference in Lisbon. Um, Portugal, and it was me, Wendy Smith, and Paula Jezebkowski, who's who's was in London. She's now in uh, Australia, mm -hmm. and we said, "I think it's time to dominate the world." I mean, we were just <laughs> joking around, right? And we realized that we were doing this what we thought was really cool work on on tensions and paradox. And they said, "You know, I think we got to bring more people into this." And so we started building a scholarly community. We basically just started working with people around the world who were also seeing tensions and starting to study them. And we went from basically five people to like during COVID, we would have these meetings and we would do them either eight in the morning or eight at night. So people around the world, we had hundreds wow. of scholars now working, using our work. Work. This is how you become one of the most cited researchers yeah. in the world. Not because that was my goal, but because we built a community. Mm -hmm. And the it's reason we met at those times is we we wanted to talk about the tensions of COVID hmm. and how do we feed that into research that really matters. So it's not being read by one, you know, five people, but you know, so it's, it's how we ended up doing work in Forbes and Fast Company. And because you start to figure out that it actually matters mm -hmm. and you've got this community around, but to me, it just makes me laugh because I always think about the five people and then <laughs> I never dreamed that those things would happen. And I'm so grateful for the community because I learned so much from these people from, they're brilliant. They're from all over the world. And we've, you know, published in many different languages and it, it is the power of diversity. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it challenges and always grows my own learning to be in those settings. Yeah. And it seems like we have a lot of themes that are just ringing throughout mm -hmm. the, it's like diversity and the power of community in like the and mm -hmm. rather than the or. And I just, it's just super cool how it's all interrelated and interconnected into all you've done into all that we're doing here um, at UC now. Um, so kind of transitioning from that, but you mentioned mm -hmm. with the diversity and the travel, it relates in a sense. I saw you spent multiple years abroad in the United Kingdom, specifically London. Um, and I bring this up because UC has a value of international mm -hmm. exploration through study abroad and even co-ops, um, as well as welcoming many international students into the college, into the colleges at UC um, so what takeaways from abroad, you spoke on it a little bit mm -hmm. already, um, are you incorporating in your position as dean? Or if there's any, like, yeah, no, I, I, th I, think it's, I think it's vital to have a global worldview. I mm -hmm. mean, to, you, need, you need the power of local. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. where you kind of build your foundation. But the stronger your local foundation, the more confidence you have to really explore and spread your wings. And, you know, point. when I was an associate dean many years ago, we 
and I'm grateful we had phenomenal colleagues here who had started this process, especially as a Midwest public school. We said, we've got to get more students abroad. Mm -hmm. And we became by far the largest school on this campus in terms of sending students abroad. Mm -hmm. We're kind of revving that back up post-COVID. But one of the reasons I did that was I think there is incredible power to being out of your comfort zone. I mean, really out of your comfort zone. I don't think it starts right off the bat. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's really nice to do kind of a baby step sometimes. Sometimes you're not quite ready to mm -hmm. take something a little bit more foreign. Um, and even as I say that, Josh, when I got to London, I just remember this vividly, right? I mean, London is the most international city in the world. Okay. Most languages spoken, most mm -hmm. fa fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah, my, that. my school had uh, faculty from 120 countries wow. and alumni from, I can't even remember what the number was. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. Out right. Of this world. And here I was, and I really thought I was culturally competent. Mm -hmm. I thought I was savvy. And within about two weeks, I realized I knew nothing. I really did. I felt completely at a loss. And I, I mean, I guess I'd always thought, oh, it's, it's England. We speak the same language. Yeah. And I was constantly being kind of smacked <laughs> by don't, don't go with your assumptions. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to ask. You just, you don't know necessarily what people are thinking and feeling it's and so doing. Amazing. But that I bring back too, because I just, I want students to have that opportunity to explore. I find it totally addictive, mm -hmm. truly. If I, I start getting antsy <laughs> if I haven't traveled a bit because, and I, I like it. to travel in some ways that yeah. push me. That's so good too, because I've been, uh, I wanted to get a study abroad in while oh. I was at my four years and with extending like my degree yeah. to graduate in the fall, I'm looking into do the Dubai trip with, with Mr. We had a campus in Dubai in London. I yeah. That so really I know Lance went on it and one of my other peers, Good. Zach went on it and they said it was such an amazing experience. So that's on my to-do list. So Good. hopefully I like that. you shall see me in Dubai <laughs> soon. Um, but moving on from that, I loved, I loved that whole answer and just all the topics you hit on. Uh, one of the most memorable, you mentioned it, one of the most memorable events I participated in during my time as a Linder College of Business student uh, was when the African-American Chamber of Commerce held their, I believe it was a monthly programming event in the Cots Attic mm -hmm. in late 2021. Um, and during this time, I had the chance to speak with many leaders within Cincinnati's minority business ecosystem, um, as well as listening to your great opening speech over the topic of interconnectedness and just like forming relationships and those bridges that you mentioned. Uh, so how important is it to you and the college to remain closely connected to Cincinnati's minority business environment and even beyond? Oh, it, it's very important. And I, and I, I still think we are learning how to do that better. Um, I, I really appreciated Nick Castro and all those who helped us bring uh, the African American Chamber of Commerce, and we've done work with the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, the European Chamber yeah, of Commerce, that others. That was, that really was good. and I, you know, to me, Josh, one of those key. There's so many elements to that, right? There's, let's take the co-op side. I mean, when we look at co-op employers, often, if not most of the time, they are big organizations, mm -hmm. which often are not the minority organizations. So making co-op accessible, yeah. right? Making our projects accessible. I love what we're doing with the Urban Impact Studio. Mm -hmm. I believe fervently in Shonda Monroe Williams yes, and, yes, and the work, right? But those, those efforts are set up to let's be proactive. Let's figure out how do we help because mm -hmm. we have the talent, both in, in of terms course. of co-op talent, full-time mm -hmm. hire talent, but also in terms of project talent, mm -hmm. research talent. And... I, this was part of, you know, let's be pervasive in our work with DEI. I mean, if inclusive excellence means inclusive excellence, we need the court that or not, I shouldn't say corporate, but more community partners mm -hmm. in this space. More often, it's better for all of us. Um, and I think we're just still learning on that front. Yes, yes. And just, I interned with, uh, I was with, it was within Centrifuge's FinTech Frontier program, okay. We Prosper, which is a black owned investment firm after my sophomore year. And just getting that firsthand accessibility to the minority entrepreneurs in our ecosystem, like what UC is doing, what Centrifuge is doing, it's just amazing. And it opens your eyes to, as you said, the talent and just what's all out there. And once you see it, you can't forget it. Mm -hmm. So then you have to implement it because it does, as you said, it needs to be implemented and it just makes everything like flow and it makes everything better. So Yes. I, I got to tell you, as you say that, because one of the award winners last night was Van Jones and so uh, Lavanda's is, is 
I, and he was one of my students years ago, and I just think the world of Van. And he is now leading the diversity investing of one of the major venture capital firms in LA. Wow. I know, that's what I say. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> right? Coming um, from Cincinnati. Yeah, coming from here. He was a uh, Cincinnati Youth Collaborative mentee hmm. once upon a time. I mean, he, he can tell you his stories. And started kind of dabbling, went to, went to big firms first, and then started dabbling himself in entrepreneurship, and then realized if you really want to fuel, fuel entrepreneurship, you got to fuel the capital, mm. right? I mean, if you don't have the money behind it, and it, it, we don't have nearly enough of the venture capital dollars mm -hmm. going into mm -hmm. minority entrepreneurs. And so he started doing this at Columba, in Columbus for Drive Capital, now he's in LA. But I just, I love stories like that because there. Val, Van is not alone, mm -hmm. right? I know that. And at the same time, I'm really proud that he's one of ours. Oh, yeah. In that work. Bearcats are doing big things. Yeah, Bearcats are. are doing big things. Um, so with that, getting more into, as you mentioned, research, mm -hmm. and you're getting like all, a lot of accolades in regard to your research, with Neo Services being built upon the core areas of business intelligence, analytic solutions, and systems, and advanced analytics. Um, as I mentioned, I saw you have a very distinguished background in research which I've been interested in mm. uh, recently with like consumer behavior and like the marketing research side. So what role do you see data playing in business today? It's a very broad question, but. Oh, what, what was the line I heard the other day? You know, data is the new gold or I, I don't know. There, yeah. You've probably Currency heard lines like that. Like, new, right, yeah. exactly. I, I mean, data is just critical. <laughs> I mean, but you look at like chat GPT. I mean, there's so much going on with AI and machine learning and everything else around data. I, I fervently believe not only is data vital from the marketing side to the operations side to the finance side to the HR side, right? Mm -hmm. How yeah. do we use data to point. learn better, faster? My caveat to that is, and kind of to my early kind of work on automation, what's the dark side? What's the other mm -hmm. side? Because we, we are building data at an incredible, I mean, it's accelerating pace. Yeah. You got to be able to actually make sure it's, it could be garbage in, garbage out, right? Mm -hmm. You got to make sure the data is good that we're, mm -hmm. uh, my cabinet, we had a cabinet meeting a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about chat GPT and they were pushing, they said, you know, we always talk about analytics and all these, and he said, they said, you know, don't ever, ever forget that the most important, one of the most important things you're doing is developing critical thinkers. They got to mm -hmm. question the data. They got to question the questions they're asking mm -hmm. of a chat GPT or whatever. That's vehicle. a really good point. I mean, they're make, they were making a really big point of you, you can build, develop analysts all day long, but it's you ultimately, mm -hmm. me, Lindner, you see, have to be developing better thinkers. Mm -hmm. If not, the, the data could be wrong. It could yeah. be meaningless. It could be biased. It could be all these things if you're not being really questioning in that process. Yeah, that's a really good point. And as you mentioned, all those, like, you have to understand what questions you're asking. The data may be skewed or biased towards one point or another. During the summer, like, my role within the internship I was doing was very data-oriented. So I got a book. It was it was called How to Become a Data Head. Okay. And it just speaks on all the intricacies of data and what you think might be, like, if you have a data set, there could be so many different errors and things wrong with that. So you have to question your data and that all mm -hmm. that you're getting and how it's being applied, what's the benchmark to that data? Because the numbers just can be so, they can vary so much based off okay. your benchmark. Um, and then the last question I have in regard to research and data, for students, some students have like a love-hate relationship with data utilization. Mm -hmm. So what would you, like advice would you give to them to go about utilizing data, whether it's in their like mm -hmm. everyday lives or professional settings, internships. Yeah, I see I see a lot of that love hate, Josh. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good point. I mean, some of that love hate can be around trust and privacy, mm. right? Kind of questions of mm. of who has your data yeah. and how is it being used are... and right and mm -hmm. a little bit of wariness. I think that's healthy. Mm -hmm. I think we should be questioning. But it goes back to the critical thinking. Um, I would also maybe say a, a different approach from a student side. So, I, so I'm dyslexic. So I have a real challenge with numbers. Mm -hmm. I know how much they matter. And I've always had great co-authors. I have great people, analysts and finance people upstairs in the dean's office. Um, so for me, it's about knowing 
how important data is, mm -hmm. how to ask good questions, how to, and then knowing how to have really good analysts mm -hmm. and data people around me. Cause it's not going to be me. Yeah. It's really not. The it's just not my strength. too is so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. I don't want people to, you know, I, I think there are plenty of people who math is not their strong mm -hmm. suit. Data is not their strong suit, but they do need to know why it matters mm -hmm. and how to use it wisely and how to engage really smart people to help them and then play to their own strengths. Yeah, that's a really good point. And in my internship last summer, I mentioned it was like very data heavy. And like, I'm not one who's like prone to go to the data side. I'm more okay. like the creative, interpersonal, just like, ideation side okay. she I was like I just like the creative side more I was speaking to my manager and she's like you can be creative with data I, and I just like I was like that kind of blew my mind so it just helped me understand and as you said like understanding how you approach it determines your experience with it yeah. so that's helped me I like a that. lot um coming coming to the last question and then we have our speed round which is new to the, the podcast so you'll be the first one <laughs> to experience that uh, but to conclude, I always ask our guests one question. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to your freshman year self, what would it be? I would say explore. Mm. I mean, this is such a beautiful time of life. Yeah. Don't, don't <laughs> yeah. stay in your cave. Get out there. Find the student organizations. Yeah. Go co-op. Go study abroad. Do it. This is your, the time yes. to spread your wings and yeah. really explore. And that's what this is set up for. Mm -hmm. And I, that's how you build your confidence. Yeah, that's the most amazing answer, too, because it's like, from the, like, I feel like I've gone through different stages of the four years, and all good has come from exploring mm -hmm. in one way or Excellent. another. That means you took advantage of it, which <laughs> is exactly what it's I here tried. for. I good. tried. <laughs> so the speed round, we're, we're almost concluded, but I have a few questions. Sure. Just answer whichever comes to mind, top top of mind. So we have the Wildcat from Kentucky, the Hoosier from Indiana, or the Bearcat from Cincinnati. Oh, it's the Bearcat every <laughs> Let's day. Let's go. Every day. Bearcat, Bearcat. Okay, second question. Favorite floor or room to get work done in Linder? Oh, I love the couch attic. I just love that space. My favorite yeah. as well. So nice. Okay, so you come to Linder on a Monday morning, and you're headed to the Starbucks. What's your go-to drink order? Nitro. Oh, oh, I love that. I love, I love that. Show. I recently had my first. Get me moving. <laughs> <laughs> I recently had my first uh, red eye, and that was an experience oh, for I sure. All right. Number four, I have to ask this mandatory Cincinnati question: Gold Star or Skyline or Skyline? Skyline. Yeah. That's a, That's what I thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> Favorite place you've lived? London. London. But well, no. As I say that, yes. But besides but, Cincinnati. I know. Besides Cincinnati. Okay. I love London. Okay. I love that. Now to. I will love Lon visiting London. No. <laughs> I like living in Cincinnati. Now it's on my, my to-do list, London. <laughs> Got to get there, Josh. And then, it's amazing. That concludes it all. I had two more about March Madness in the Big 12, but I don't watch basketball anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dean Lewis, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us on In the Know with Neo, sharing your perspectives your experiences and your values. Um, I often reflect over my four years as a Bearcat, and I remember coming in as a freshman during the time as you began as the Dean, um, and it's so inspiring to see the growth um, of individuals and the student body has made alongside the learnings uh, we've all experienced since you became the Dean of the Linder College of Business. So thank you once again, um, and we're all looking forward to the final weeks of the semester. Josh, let me just say thank you, because I really thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for being the inaugural podcast <laughs> in our beautiful new studio. We're this honored. is awesome. And really, thank you to Neil. I, I just think the, very highly of the student organization. It is so impressive how far you've come so fast. Mm -hmm. And I just look forward to great work to come. And once you're an alumni, you'll come back and see yes, everything yes. just getting better thank from the you foundations so you've helped build. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the episode of In the Know with Neo. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you're interested in learning more about Neo's mission and vision, follow us on social media at Neo Initiative or visit our website at neocincy.com.